Welcome to Semi-Retired with your hosts, Dave Farrant and Richard Bonomo. Hey Richard, how was your week? Uh, pretty quiet in my case. Uh, you, you have anything exciting happen? Well, if you're like me, you're probably feeling a little bit relieved that Operation Unicorn is over. And when I say <laughs> Operation Unicorn, I refer to the plan the British government uncorked when uh, Queen Elizabeth died in Scotland. Oh, I thought you meant my uh, my secret cosplay <laughs> uniform. Oh, you have one of those? Oh, because I need it's to. Bo- it's a unicorn. Because I need to borrow one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, apparently, the operation would have been called Operation London Bridge, but because she passed away at Balmoral in Scotland, it became Operation Unicorn. And if it sounds to listeners like I'm being disrespectful, I don't mean to, because I was a fan of of Queen Elizabeth. I mean, she's reigned since 12 years before I was born. And this isn't a comment on monarchy. That's a whole other debate. But I thought she did a, a good job for what she had to do. And when, and when I look back over the last 56 years, when I think of things like the James Bond book and movie, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the Beatles ending their career with Her Majesty, the little song there. I want to tell her that I love her a lot, but I got to get a belly full of wine. Her Majesty is a pretty nice girl. One day I'm going to make her mine. A little, and, and, a little odd. It's like he's hitting on the Queen. Well, he was. And nobody hit somehow it worked. <laughs> and, and, and tell me this. Would Freddie Mercury's band have sounded as good as it was if it was called King? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think so. Yeah, someone was saying, um, I, I saw this on, on Twitter somewhere, someone was saying, uh, here's an idea for the next James Bond, the reboot on His Majesty's Secret Service as a as a, a way to reboot the series yet again. And yet, I know, again, it just doesn't have the same ring. And we're going to wind up with, with Charles on our all over our money and our coins and our stamps. And I, yeah, I'm like, I don't I know. I think we should put Charles on all our crypto. <laughs> yeah, okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> Fine for that. The only time I had support crypto. Yeah, I've blown hot and cold on that yeah. one. So anybody who has who listened to the intro for our show, the trailer, will know that uh, Richard and I are both avid photographers, and we're in fact both presidents of a, of a local camera club here in Montreal. And so today, for the first time, we're tackling a photo-based topic uh, that Richard brought to my attention. So I'm about to turn things over. And Richard, what are we doing? We're going to be talking about the 1962 movie La Jetée, which is the greatest slideshow you've never seen. The greatest slide, right. That, that I've, I never have. Well, I hadn't seen it till recently, but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and I say this, and, and I'm assuming most of the audience will have no idea what we're talking about. Right. Nor even know what the name means, right? No, exactly. It being a French name. It being a French name, exactly. Uh, La Jetée, it translates as the jetty or the pier. Or the observation platform. Exactly. Because I thought a pier, for me, a pier is something like water. You get boats tied up to the pier. But it really refers to the observation platform at an airport. Or the airport in France, where people would go to watch the planes uh, take off and land. Right, so gotcha. bring your family. It was a big family event. So 1962, French airport observation platform. A science fiction film from 62, done in a very different way, as we'll see. It, it's not filmed in the traditional way. It's made of a series of 400 plus photographs that are set to music and narration in a very, very unique way. Hence the term slideshow. Exactly. Hence the term slideshow. So before we dive into slideshow, I thought we could go back to the, the early days of the slideshow. You've all seen, you've seen a slideshow, your your parents or oh, your, of course. an uncle or yeah. a friend would have put on a slideshow. And of course, as as members of a camera club for many years, we've seen many, many multo, slideshows. Multo, multo slideshows. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Many slideshows. Sitting in the dark with that ka ching ka ching Yeah, exactly. The projector. The, the projector or in later days, just the... <sighs> <laughs> hum of the digital projector, yes. right? So if we'll go back a little bit. And this is not meant to be an art history class. I just wanted to go back and talk about how we started with stills, went to motion uh, images and to, to make motion pictures, obviously, and how someone decided to to do something with stills to make a motion picture. So if we go back uh, to the original slideshow, I think it would be that guy spitting on his hand in a cave, right? You've seen those things? Oh, Where yeah. they, they would have the paint and... Right, a spit on the hands. outline of his hand, right? Yeah, the outline of the hand, or you've yeah. seen the cave paintings, right? Which would depict... Yeah, like uh, Lascaux, France and stuff exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You would depict a, a, an event. And if you looked at it, it's like, hey, there's a slideshow of what happened last week. We hunted the buffalo. Man, I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not the buffalo, but <laughs> well, <laughs> we, could... we hunted the elk. And so from there, you move on, you know, from cave paintings down to the golden era of painting canvases. We think of canvases yes. and, you know, dark paints and whatever and watercolors. <clears throat> Chiaroscuro. Oh, <laughs> exactly. All those guys. the frescoes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 which were which were you know captures of an event, a moment in time, iconic scenes of Venus coming out of the clamshell. That's why we like flams so much. We're hoping Venus pops out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hope springs eternal. 
<laughs> and then and then you get like the advent of photography in the uh, 1800s, right in France, uh, with that famous first photograph ever made. It's like uh, looking out the window onto that street in right. France. Yeah, 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 Nieps or something like that. The guy's name was right. Uh, Joseph Nisa for Nieps or something yeah. like. That. And then in 1900s, we get a film starts to come out, a commercially available film, and we have the advent of you know probably one of the biggest selling cameras of all time, the Brownie at the time, right? Right, the Kodak Brownie. And then this is the thing, you know, people say I have a Brownie. It's a very collectible. <laughs> like, you know, they made millions of those. Yeah, yeah I think so. Anything made in the millions is not collectible. So, so this was the first camera that I think the average person could buy, right? Exactly. There wasn't like the whole, you think of the professional photographers with that big kind of like a tent over their heads and all that stuff, right? Yeah, big view camera. Yeah, a big exactly. view yeah, camera. Yeah. So now it's now the average dude could buy a camera and, and get some uh, some prints of his family. Exactly. Right. And my, when I, growing up, my mom had a Brownie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my dad too. No, my dad yeah. had a brownie. Brownie with a big flash on the top. And right. I think ours was like some sort of avocado green, if I remember. Oh, of course. Yeah. It would have to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have to be. I think it was a lot. So you have movie studios started coming out with movies. So we have moving pictures, which was the yes. original title, right? So you yes. have your stills combined in such a way that when played at a certain speed, you get motion. Right. You get moving pictures. In 1936, Kodak comes out with probably the most famous light film of all, Kodachrome. And, Mama, don't um, take my Kodachrome away. And, and from there, we get the advent of the slideshow as we know it. When we say slideshow, you know, refers to the actual physical slides, the little two by two slides. Now, do you remember the time we were on Dorville Island uh, for the retreat and we so we came across all those glass slides? Yeah, I think so. Eh? Yeah. This yeah. is a camera club retreat, by the way. That's some weird religious <laughs> thing Rich is talking about. <laughs> it's actually a camera club meeting. Yeah, a camera club meeting yeah. we held on the island. Yeah, they had all those glass slides, right? Yes. That was that would have been popular back in the 1600s. They would have these glass slides that they would put in things called magic lanterns, right? Oh, yeah. Which I've basically that, was yeah. a lantern with a glass that would project images on the walls. And right. you might have, you know, a band playing some music. And they were often used in seances to try to make apparitions appear. And, you know, sometimes they would even do this with multiple magic lanterns to do uh, special effects and stuff. So, oh, fancy. Uh, and this yeah, was yeah. in the 1600s? 1600s, 1700s. That, yeah, right? yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So the slideshow, not for everybody. Not everybody had access to some of these devices. Some of these were like giant carts, right? Where they would move, they would walk the cart forward to have the sense of motion on the walls. Pretty wild stuff for its day. But again, not something uh, the average person could do until Kodak comes out with Kodachrome, which is probably the first real commercially available slide film. And then everybody could shoot. And of course, for younger listeners, the slide is that little cardboard mount. And in the middle of it is that, you know, semi, you know, tr- translucent yeah. film where you can see the image. Yeah, yeah. And it's a positive as opposed to being a negative, right? There so you, you could hold yeah. it up to the light and see right. through it yeah nothing to do with powerpoint kids <laughs> no we're not even going to go powerpoint no no uh so you have slideshows right i mean we've all seen slideshows at the house uh yeah. you know we would have had i always say my uncle because i had an uncle who was a photographer my godfather was a photographer and uh so i always picture him although i may never have seen a slideshow in my head i see him showing me a slideshow and that's just it, as important to my mind <laughs> to imagine that you saw that fantasy is very important yeah. so we're, we're gonna pop into the 60s because this movie is from the 60s think of the pink floyd shows right where, where right. they would have these projections behind them on them yes uh, often done with slides or movies or whatever and this was a way to give life to us uh, well that was like with oils they used thing and you get these organic shapes that yeah. were kind of pulsating behind the bands they were big in san francisco as well you know most of the slideshows we've seen your dad's or in this case camera club would often be silent or there might be some narration right yeah. there might be a little narration there may be some music uh some of the more adventurous Adventurous presenters would have had the soundtrack, either of some music playing while the slideshow was going on, or maybe a little a little narration, or if you're fancy enough, they would have recorded some some of the uh, sounds on location. So we get to the 60s, and in the 60s, you get this gang of avant-garde filmmakers in France, known as the left bankists. Well, the left banks were part of what's called the French New Wave, okay, right? Where the you French had New Wave. All right. you had left bank and you had right bank. Okay, and so I was looking at the left bank were the more commercially successful or backed filmmakers. Think of um, Jean Luc Godard. Jean Luc Godard, who did the, yes. the famous Breathless, right? I don't know if you have ever seen the. I've not, but I'm, I'm aware of it, but okay. never seen it. Yeah. And he just passed. He just died. Also, uh, in fact, he did. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. I right? saw that. Yeah, in the news, yeah. So he did Breathless, which was an early uh, film uh, with Jean Luc Belmondo, redone in the uh, 80s. I think with uh, Richard Gere. 
No way. Yeah. And it's an almost shot for shot copy. Yeah, it's pretty good. The original is interesting to see. It's got that really French feel, very artsy, as opposed to the Richard Gere version, which is, you know, obviously more modern. Yeah, the, the, the you know, those French films of that era had a really particular look. G- generally black and white, I think. Yes, exactly. So you get you get the whole series of French New Wave and they start experimenting with film. Not, not necessarily surreal, but they'll start doing different editing styles. This led me down i'm just going to take an aside now to look this up so i started looking at these uh, avant-garde filmmaking in the 60s and i come across this guy called arthur lipsip who was from montreal and uh he he went to l'école des beaux-arts in montreal and there his mentor arthur lismer who you may not know is not a popular name but he was one of the group of seven the group of seven the famous painters famous and Canadian painters okay so let me see if i get this straight arthur lipson's mentor is arthur lismer yeah they both have the same initials hmm. <laughs> Something suspicious about that. Conspiracy. Yeah, I think so. Maybe we'll have to do a show about that. Uh, Maybe we will. Yeah, so from the group of seven, recommended him to the National Film Board. So he gets a job in the National Film Board, starts doing animation. So I looked this guy up and I come across a few of his movies. And one of his uh, his most famous movie is a nine minute black and white movie called 21 87, also known as 2187. And this isn't a slideshow now. This is a real movie, right? This is a real motion picture. It's a motion picture, but it's in this this style of filmmaking where it's done with fast found footage. So uh, Arthur Lipset at the uh, National Film Board comes across a series of like, you know, discarded uh, video files. Okay. And he combines this with audio and some film, uh, films that he goes out and takes in Montreal and in New York City in the 60s. And he combines this into one movie, nine minutes long. And in there is all this, this sound that is not part of the movie, but is added, but is kind of complementary to the movie. And it's a whole series of scenes of life in New York and Montreal. And I'm watching this. Yeah, a certain part of the movie, I look and I pause the movie and I go, oh my God. I think the guy in the movie is my wife's grandfather. Talk about six degrees of separation. <laughs> six degrees of separation. Man. Exactly. So I rewind it and I look at it and I look at it again and go, oh my God. So I call my wife in and I said, is this your grandfather? And she goes, I think it might be. And so we we try to dig through the old photos and the only photos we have are 30 years later of him when he's in his 90s. Right. And so we sent it to my sister-in-law who looks at it and goes, oh my God, it just might be. And so it's weird because my wife's grandfather was an amateur filmmaker. There's a whole series series of movies he's made and he would stage these productions oh, the with his kids. the plot thickens, Richard, yeah, the plot we, thickens. Exactly. He was an amateur movie maker and he had these whole things done and all his kids appeared in this and it would be like a day at the races or I'm making this up and it would be like the series of movies that he would have, you know, scripted and shot. Anyways, you keep going and you watch the movie. Now, the interesting part of 2187 is it's the movie that inspired George Lucas of... Star Wars? Star Wars, exactly. And 2187 inspired him because at a certain point, there's a line in the movie uh, we hear about halfway through the movie, and the narrator says something to the effect of, and some people call this uh, the force or uh, this element behind the mask. And apparently this is where George Lucas got the idea for the force, for Star Wars. And the mask being Darth Vader? Well, I I don't know. They don't (laughs) mention that part. But to me, when I hear the line, I think the force and behind the mask. I think of Darth Vader yeah, right sure, away. Of course you do, yeah. And another little piece of trivia, 2187, the name of the movie, is also the number of uh, Princess Leia's uh, prison cell. And it continues Ooh. through other Star, Star Wars Ooh. movies. Yeah, so big homage to... I felt uh, a, uh, like a frisson yeah. on the back of my hand, which is French for a, a frisson. shiver. Millions of voices snuffed yeah. out in the night. So but, but where did he get 2187 from, that original? Does it mean something? It's something in the in the audio. If you listen to it at a certain point, someone says, and he's assigned the number, the number 2187. Oh, okay. It's All just right. something that just happens random. to be... Yeah, okay. it's random in the narration, and he decided to the name of the movie. Well, consistent with the found footage. So found footage, found title, I guess. So it inspired uh, George Lucas. He went on to do THX 1127, his movie. And so you have a series of uh, filmmakers who were doing these avant-garde style movies, uh, including uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s father, whose name I think is obvious. Uh, Fred Downey? (laughs) Who did a movie called Chafed Elbows in the same sort of style done with uh, stills. Chafed Elbows, eh? Chafed Elbows, Is that what you get when you make out at the beach? (laughs) It's funny, when I hear Chafed Elbows, I I picture uh, Charlie Chaplin, which Robert Downey Jr. uh, played in in a movie, right? Oh, man. Chaplin, yeah. Nominated for an Oscar for that. Uh, So we, we get to the movie, which is... 
science fiction. It's, back to La Jete now, yeah, right? Yeah, back to La Jete. Hey, the observation platform. It's a science fiction movie about time travel. And who made uh, La Jete? Okay, so La Jete is uh, made by Chris Marker, who was part of the left bank style of filmmaker. Not much is really known about him. This guy doesn't like to do interviews, doesn't want to be photographed, so there's not a lot of historical stuff you can find. But here we have a uh, hot off the press. His name is Christian Hippolyte François-Georges Bush Villeneuve. Well, there's a mouthful. Yeah, so Chris Marker is, uh, is so probably... Easy, Chris Marker. <laughs> it's probably an easier name and it's kind of a, uh, you know... Thereby like, completely defrancisizing himself. Because he becomes he would a more think mainstream. Chris, yeah, exactly. You yeah. would think Chris Marker sounds like a guy from Chicago or something, Chicago. right? Chicago. Okay, so yeah. French guy, Chris Marker. So he, he makes a movie based on stills. All still images. Like I said, there's about 400 plus photographs. It's essentially a slideshow because it's, it's a series of still images images with narration, music, and there's some environmental sounds. You hear the, at the beginning, you'll hear the airplane. Yeah, at right. some points you hear whispering, you hear, uh, you hear, I think you hear clocks at one point. I've been meaning to watch it because it's the movie that inspired 12 Monkeys. Oh, I love 12 Monkeys. Yeah. Oh yeah, terrific movie. Yeah, yeah. It's a great mo- So if you think of the movie 12 Monkeys, the Bruce Willis part is essentially what La Jete is. Okay, when, right. When you, they've yeah. expanded on it, but the, the kernel of what happens to Bruce Willis in 12 Monkeys is what happens in La Jete. Right, 12 Monkeys made by Terry Gilliam of Monty Python fame, I yes. think. And he's the, he's the only American member, right? I of, believe you're correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I saw him in an interview and I'm like, hey, he does not, oh, he's the, he's the American. The, the long Yank, Yank. Who has quite a unique style of filmmaking. I think of Brazil and some Baron of, Munchausen, oh, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. Time Bandits, maybe? He, yes, yes, he did Time yeah. Bandits. Yeah, he's, he's great, hey, yeah, Terry Gilliam, he's great. I think. And he's a, he's a big fan. He was a big fan of La Jete, considered as beautifully edited. Uh, it's just to him a great piece of film. Uh, so let's just say, not long, 28 minutes. Starts off with the scene of the uh, the airport. We see the pier, La Jete, the, the jetty at the early airport. The observation platform. It, and it's a zoom out scene. So it's not a static shot. He zooms out on the photograph a little bit like... A little Ken Burns. Little, little Ken, Ken Burns, Burns exactly. Yeah. Ken Burns famously would have done with his documentaries later on in the 80s, right? I, mean, I think, yeah, Burns, 80s, I feel yeah. like the 80s is right, yeah. yeah. Where they would take still... I mean, this was something people would do where you would take a still and you would pan across it to kind of give it a bit of motion. Yeah, we even did that in school, believe it or not. Yeah. They taught us to do that. And now it's like a built-in effect into software, right? I mean, in right, iMovie, is, you load yeah. anything and it, it does the Ken Burns. You, you have to dig to turn that off. You know? <laughs> I think it's become almost cliche now. So the movie starts off. We got that scene and then titles come on. And what's interesting is in the credits, it says a photo roman by Chris Marker. A roman, which we would tend to think to say romance, but no, a roman in French is a novel. It, that's right. So it's a photo novel, picture book, maybe phrased a uh, Similarly? Kind of. Now, yeah. Dave, I don't know if you've ever seen this. When I was uh, younger, I used to frequent, you know, newsstands and magazine stores like I was a fanatic magazine reader. And there was a thing called the photo romance, the photo roman. Yeah, you're right. Which were, would have looked like comic books. You'd open them up and there would be panels like comic books, but they were all photos with the text inserted. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And this about. is yeah. the photorama. Okay, I got it. No, I've, I've seen what you're talking about. Yeah. Not something I ever read or looked at, but I know what you mean. And I think I, I worked with a woman who was who was from Belgium, and I think she used to read these in, in the lunchroom. That's where I seem to have this association with her. I'm suspicious of Belgians. You know, little mayonnaise with <laughs> oh, French fries. Stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you try mayonnaise, that is fantastic. Is it really? Oh, it is. It's, okay, it's, so I, I take yeah. that back. Yeah, take it back. I'm sorry, Belgium. Yeah, she told us the stories of uh, growing up during the war, which were quite horrific. No, I really feel bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is a play on that. The photo roman would be like, you'd open it up and like a comic book, you would have a series of images, panels. And this is done with one static image. So in the movie, it's you're not going to see like four images up on screen. You're going to see one image and then some voiceover. Fully black and white, shot with a Pentax Spotmatic, except for one little sequence, a very, very short sequence when one of the characters is in bed and you see her eyes open and she turns her head and her eyes open. That was shot with an Aeriflex 35 millimeter film camera. And and the story goes, he only had money to rent the camera for one day. Oh. So it was a very short sequence. Necessity <laughs> being the mother of invention then, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I love the idea of creating a movie out of stills. And one of the things I always remember from the club was we always had slideshows that had the same, pretty much the same duration per slide. Right, yeah. and even like if four there, seconds, right? I think it's kind yeah, of the yeah, standard. Yeah, there was a standard right? four, four to seconds, si- four yeah. to six seconds, whatever. Yeah. And it was always stack, stack, 
stack your, your 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 image would go even in the days of digital they might add music but I, I always thought like how come we're not syncing the slide to the music tone it would yeah, have a little been bit nice rhythm going if, there, yeah, right? if the music's got a little ta 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 and we do three slides in a row to give it life to connect you between the two because you have music playing in the background and you're looking at images it's like listening to the radio and watching tv i know you can't see this but richard started dancing there for a few seconds <laughs> Interpretive dancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, isn't that, isn't that the line Alex used to say? I don't know who it's attributed to. Talking about photography is like dancing about architecture. Oh, that's good. <laughs> who said that? Alex used to quote it, but it, it's oh, not Alex his at line. the club. Yeah, Alex okay, used to. Okay, one of our club members. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Alex, yeah. He always used to say, I don't know where the line comes from originally, but yeah. I, it's, you know, you can say that about a lot of uh, the visual mediums, right? I like you, it, yeah. yeah. So uh, the movie goes on and it's basically the plot is a man who is in the future in our future it's after World War 3 has devastated Paris so they mentioned Paris because the you know most of uh, Paris is destroyed everybody's living underground and the scientists are trying to find a solution basically mankind is doomed they're, they're running out of food they're running out of energy they're running out of medicine so they think the answer is in time so they want to send someone back in time to maybe try to avert the disaster so they start a series of experiments and as it's done in the voiceover you'll notice it says um, you know a lot of the people who go back in time end up dying so it's this weird procedure they're lying in like a kind of a stretcher they put these things on their eyes they look like little eye masks and they inject them with something and the person travels back in time so the idea is if you have an an actual memory of the past the drug or whatever they give you can send you back to that time so As, it's kind of like an anchor point back there and they can send you to the anchor point point. and a lot of the people who are sent back end up dying because the memory isn't strong enough so right. when they go back in time they go into a time that's kind of out of sync and so their brain can handle it and they die in the chair eventually they come across our hero and he has very distinct memories of his childhood very very strong images and he always remembers this scene of being on the pier in Orly and this image of this woman, which is like the first shot you see uh, at the beginning of the movie. So they send them back in time multiple times. I mean, we're not going to break out the whole, I'm not going to go into detail for the whole story. If you want, there's plenty of videos uh, explaining the whole philosophy and stuff. We're just going to... And Legete is on YouTube. You can get it. You yeah, can so watch it on YouTube. We'll drop a link in the show notes. Yeah. The original is obviously narrated in French. On YouTube, it's available with the English narration. That's right. Yeah. yeah, both. I saw that both are available. And what's really amazing is Chris Marker also put out a book. So I ha- I actually bought the book. It's the entire movie as photos, which Neat. is apropos, right? I mean, yeah. the movie is made of photos. So you can flip around and, and the book has the uh, the narration as subtitles in English and French in the book. So that's that's kind of nice. So you can follow along, flip back and and, and look at, at moments in time. So our hero goes through, has all these memories. I won't spoil the ending. He goes back in time and he interacts many times with uh, the woman from his memory there's a whole series of scenes well i think what's interesting about the mu- the movie is the photography the photography was done by chris marker the people in the movie are friends of his so he doesn't appear he doesn't do the narration he's not one of the characters he basically takes the photos and then made the movie and so the photography dave what, what, what did you think of the the style of that it's black and white it's very grainy looking it's a little bit high contrast and it has a very urgent immediate feel to it i notice whenever there's a horizon line it's a little bit tip. Everything seems a little bit out of kilter. And it just delivers a a really emotional, gritty impression. When we see the main character having his um, time travel treatments where there's injections and all that, it's really quite painful to look at. Mm -hmm. You know, he's in in some kind of a hammock. As Richard mentioned, he's got some kind of a mask over his eyes, which what looks like wires. Like, it's very low tech. There's nothing modern going on here. And combine that with that grainy black and white, almost like a war documentary feel, it's really heavy. And, you know, uh, that kind of photography black and white grainy high contrast intimate ding 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 rings up rings all my bells i mean i love that kind of stuff richard's dancing again i'm dancing <laughs> i'm dancing for architecture <laughs> And when you compare it to things like, think of uh, of Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, which, oh, would have been, that, yeah. which would have been roughly in the same time frame, the colors, the costumes, yeah. the beauty. Or think of Sofia Coppola's uh, Marie Antoinette, yeah. you know, very stylized, very yeah. pastel This is not that, and it's not meant to be, and I don't think it needs to be. I think it would spoil it if this was in color, because it is a post-apocalyptic oh, 100%. future. Oh, yeah, you would want this in color. Yeah. You want that graininess, you want that darkness, that sense of dread and yes. foreboding. Voting. 
And the camera shots are interesting too in that, you know, they might do a shot of his face when he's getting the injection and then they'll they'll be like one or two zoom-ins or close-up shots. If they're not zooming in, these are different shots of his face as he's reacting to the pain he's in. Yeah, because they're, they're not classically beautiful compositions in that sense. Like they look very like they're caught on the fly. I mean, the, the point is always there. You see why he's taken the photograph, but it had, again, it has that sense of being done by somebody in a rush who doesn't have a lot of time to take the photo, which again, contributes to that sense of chaos that permeates the piece. So, some of the, the images have a, a sense of like street photography style where, Very much so. you know, you'll, you'll see like lots of shots of the man and the woman walking on the street and then they'll show other kids or other people. So you get that kind of street photography uh, shot, but... None of the images stands on his own. You would have to have it as a series. And I think it goes back true. to, I think that's true, you know, yeah. often you, you, you we'd see series, we'd see images, someone would present something and they'd show an image and we'd say, this, this is a great image, but it needs to work as a series. Yes. It, on its own, it doesn't tell enough of a story. Yes. And I think this is the, the epitome of that. It's just none of them could necessarily stand on their own, but together they're cohesive. They, they, they come together and tell a beautiful story. I agree. Yeah. No, that's, that's very well said. Yeah. And as I think back, there is a sense that none of those would be like you wouldn't frame them put them on your uh, on your wall but to look at them in the context of the slideshow uh, the photo novel or the book that you purchase makes every bit of sense the aspect of time travel is very well handled in it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I love I loved time travel, frankly, as a topic. Uh, I think we're both science fiction fans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And it's time travel done in, uh, I don't want to say an intelligent way, but it's done in a way that's... You can th- say that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's not done... I mean, this is not back to the future where we go back and we change our future. Right, uh, yeah, because he has to go back. The guy, the, the main character has to go back and reintroduce his parents to one another or something like yeah, that, Yeah, yeah, right? Marty, exactly. Yeah, Marty, that's starts- to disappear. Seen it. Yeah, he starts because to disappear. If they never yeah. met, he can't exist. He can't exist. The grandfather paradox, right? Yes. yes if you could go back paradox. in time and shoot your grandfather, yeah. you wouldn't exist, but then you couldn't have gone back to shoot your... Ah, my brain. Yeah, this also happened in Star Trek. For those Star Trek fans out there, original series, uh, one of the most famous episodes was called The City on the Edge of Forever, written by Harlan Ellison. And in this episode, Kirk and Spock wind up back on Earth in the 1930s, just before World War II. And Kirk falls in love. Of course, Kirk falls falls in love with a woman who will ignite the pacifist movement in the United States, thereby preventing the United States from entering World War II, thereby allowing Hitler to win. And Spock finds out, because Spock, Spock, that she's going to die in a car crash at a particular time, and Kirk, uh, who has fallen in love with her, must prevent himself from saving her. He must let his new love die to save the future and the earth that they're in, which is, of course, the illogical way of doing this, yeah. as Richard just pointed out. And who played the, the love interest? Joan Collins. Joan Collins, yeah. exactly. So, uh, a very early uh, appearance for Joan Collins. Yes, yeah, yeah she's yeah, she's very young there. So there, there is time travel in there, but it's not done again in like you can go in the past and change it. So even though they're trying to go to the past, they're trying to find a solution for the future. The, the one of the central messages is you can't escape your own time. Right. So even by cheating by traveling time, because at some point in the movie he also travels into the future. They send him there to see if mankind really doomed, and he goes into the future and he realizes, oh, it's not. It's not really doomed you know it's been rebuilt somehow we've survived right yeah, it's yeah. become a utopian society and and the 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 future beings ask him they say you know they've mastered time travel now and they offer to take him to the future if he wants and he refuses and he wants to go back to the time in the past of his memory have you noticed we've been promised utopia for about the last 50 or 60 years yeah we should talk Remember about that, that we're also, we were in turtlenecks <laughs> And like driving white cars. Flying cars. And fly, white flying and not, not working that much anymore. Yeah, what yeah. happened? <laughs> we, we got most of the tech and, and more work. Yeah, and then we wind up semi-retired uh, doing a podcast. <laughs> we should talk about that on an episode. Yeah, maybe might, one day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I, and I was uh, watching a few of the commentary videos on this. And there's a, a YouTube channel called The Cinema Tech, I think, who really summed it up most beautifully. You can't change the past because you didn't. Oh, that's nice. Oh, yeah. Isn't oh, that yeah. nice? That And then it says it, it's, yeah. it's exactly what happens in the story. Yeah. It won't spoil the ending, but the memory that he has as a child... Well, I guess we could spoil it. Most most people have seen 12 Monkeys anyways. So the image he has as a child is he only realizes later is he sees himself get killed on the pier, which is, is interesting in that he appears twice because yeah. he's on the pier as a child. He's on the pier as an adult, and he's also alive in the future 
In the hammock. So he's in three different places. He, he lives three, he's there right. three times. I was about to say at the same yeah. time, but that, of course, would be an anachronism. It's yeah. not the same time. Yeah. I, I can't even come up with a sentence that describes that. Yeah, so it's kind of weird that he dies in the past, but also in the future. Have you seen Dark? Yes. The, oh, uh, my God. Okay, so yeah, that's a German production. I think it's on Netflix, yeah. a yeah. science fiction series based on time travel. Yeah. That's a whole other episode. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a crazy time travel story. That is probably one of the most elaborate and... And confu- not confusing, but intricate time Complex travel. intricate, yeah. So intricate that if you go to the Wikipedia page, they give you the family trees for seasons one, two, and three because, hey, things change. Hey, no. I, yeah. Hey, look, I had to download those things onto my <laughs> iPad because I couldn't keep track. And, and people have put effort into kind of drawing these diagrams because yeah. you can't remember. Yeah. I couldn't remember. I, I was just yeah. beyond well, they, me. They have the family trees in the movie too at one point. Whenever they get to that that oh, mansion, you, you see the family trees every so often. I don't remember that. And so... And I, I think they jumped the shark with season three. Uh, season ones and two are great. And then season three says, oh yeah, you know what? We did something. Let's freaking blow their minds with season three. Right. See, you, which you haven't seen yet. No, I've only seen one and two. You're right. Yeah. Season three is wow. That's it. I keep thinking I should try it, but it seems like it's going to be heavy lifting. And maybe it, you're it telling is, me it is. It yeah. is heavy lifting. And the I, I found the end, although I, I, you know, I say they jumped the shark, I find the end is interesting. Because it it puts a different spin on everything. Yeah, 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 so I'll go back to it. You know, I'll go back to it. It's worth watching. Because I was just, I was so impressed with seasons one and two. I I just, uh, and again, loving time travel as a subject, seeing a whole series, uh, uh, I don't know how many episodes, a long form series focusing on time travel. Yeah, I just loved it. What's nice is it's, uh, because it's German, I don't speak German, you don't speak German, so you're forced to pay attention because you have to read the subtitles, Yes. so you can't be on your phone at the same time, so it's a show that forces you to really look at everything, and every so often, you'll catch stuff because you're paying so much attention to it that you would would have missed otherwise, I'm I'm sure. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's true, it does require a bit more engagement, eh, to read subtitles. That's why I like watching a foreign series, I find, because you have to immerse yourself a little more because you have to read the subtitle. So La Jete, if I had come across it as a something on Netflix or and didn't know the attachment to 12 Monkeys or whatever, probably never would have watched it. I was thinking the same thing. If I had just randomly found it, you know, without you setting it up for me and giving me a sense of what it was about, I, I'm not sure I would have absorbed it. Maybe that's you know, maybe failing on our part. Maybe we've changed since, or me, since the 60s. Maybe people were better off at... Uh, at uh, dealing with abstract symbolist kind of work back then. I don't know. But for anyone who's a fan of photography, who's a fan of filmmaking... Uh, I think I think it's worth it's worth a while. It's only twenty eight minutes oh, no, out it's of your worth life. It. No, yeah. you gotta you gotta you yeah. gotta you gotta see it. I mean, yeah, yeah, twenty eight minutes. It's, it's a landmark piece of work. In fact, the British Film Institute has it listed in its top fifty movies uh, wow. of all time. Yeah, okay. yeah and it's the, part of the Criterion Collection too. Oh, well, there, which there is, you go. There you go. Yeah. There's, there's, there's two hats off to done uh, right there. Yeah, yeah, done like yeah. dinner. Uh, yeah, so a really worthwhile movie. I think anybody who's got a bit of time, just throw it on and put your phone down. Watch it in whatever language you want. I watched it in French. No subtitles in English. I watched it completely in French. The first time I watched it, it had uh, the English subtitles. And this time when I watched it, I watched it just with a French narration. And I think we have to speak about the narration. The narr- it's really well done. Even Kiel, it's masterful. He doesn't try to emphasize things. He tells the story as it's going. Yeah, so I, I watched the English narration and I experienced something similar. Uh, I did find the particular narrator's, I found his timing a bit off or mm-hmm. his intonation a bit off. I, in a way, it almost made it difficult for me to follow what was going on. I'm not sure if he's just not a very good narrator or if that was some kind of direction he was supposed to be supposed to do it that way because that's part of the overall vibe. I don't know. Well, watch it again with the French narration. He, he does a masterful job and the, the score is very well done. And I like also, there are parts of the movie that are black screen where they'll, you know, they'll have a photograph and then it goes black for a while and then the photo comes on. Almost like giving you a pause, a breather, a mental breather. Yeah. And there are moments of silence also where there's just images and no sound. So very, very uh, interesting use of sound design also in the movie. It, it's worth it to watch it if you like photography, you like movie making, and you like audio editing, as it used to be done. Yeah, if, if you're intrigued by time travel. Science sure. fiction. Science fiction. Yeah. And you know, just, uh, again, as Richard said, like a, a really interesting slice of early 60s French filmmaking. Absolutely.
So that was our look at Le Jeté. Thank you, Richard, for suggesting it. I certainly enjoyed watching it and finding out about it. It filled in uh, a, a nice blank for me, especially with the relationship with uh, 12 Monkeys, a movie I've always enjoyed. So um, yeah, great. Thank you. No problem. And if you have time, also look up 21-87, the movie that inspired George Lucas to see some old shots of Montreal and see what created The Fools. I'm going to do it. Have a great week. Thanks. You too. 